workforce work. Today, um, with my colleague Nardia Grant, who's with Unearth Environmental Services, we'll provide you some overview of opportunities for reforestation on disturbed lands in both the US and Australia. In 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reported that an increase in 1 billion hectares of forest on Earth could limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C by 2015 and thereby prevent a climate crisis. Um, the 1 billion hectares of forest is interesting because that equals out to be approximately 1 trillion trees. And the question becomes, where would those 1 trillion trees be planted? So there are many places on the earth with, that won't support forested vegetation, including deserts and ice caps. Um, we would also want to avoid areas that are currently in production agricultural due to food security issues. Urban areas could provide some opportunities for planting of trees, but when we're looking at a trillion trees, um, probably that's not going to be the best place to look for those opportunities. And then with climate change and the increase in wildfires that we've seen in Australia and the western part of the United States, we probably want to avoid suburban areas or areas where you have a wildland urban interface due to issues with potential wildfire. In 2019, Baston and Associates conducted a study using GIS and remote sensing to locate the best places on earth for reforestation opportunities that excluded current forests, deserts, productive farmlands, cities, and suburban areas. And in this assessment, they located 0.9 billion hectares. Um, and most of that was found primarily in marginal and disturbed landscapes. In the United States, um, the temperate hardwood forest of the eastern United States was determined to be one of the ideal locations for reforestation opportunities. Similarly, the eastern coast of Australia um, where the tropical forest exists had the highest potential there. Now, it's interesting, um, these two places are a world apart, but they do have something in common. Um, both of these areas that were highlighted are um, focal areas for coal mining and disturbed, disturbed landscapes due to coal mining activities. This is a picture of the Appalachian mountain range in the United States, um, a coal mine operation there. And here's a coal mine operation in the Hunter Valley of Australia. What they have similar, as you might notice, <laughs> big holes in the ground, but also if you look at to the edge of the mine land, in the back of this picture, you'll see a woodland. Um, similarly in Appalachia, on the edge of the forest, you find forest. So both of these areas contain forested landscapes prior to the disturbance from the coal mining. This is a picture of the Appalachian forest um, prior to its being mining. And the Appalachian Forest is not only the oldest mountain range in the United States, but it's considered to be one of the more biodiverse areas in the temperate regions of the world. It's a very important migratory um, corridor for animals because it does run north-south. Um, and it's of significant you know, um, concern for um, species migration. So the coal mining, they deforest the area, they extract the coal, and then afterwards you end up with a landscape that looks something like this. Um, one of the things that we notice is the actual shape of the land has been transformed um, from sort of steep um, hilly slopes to more of a flat landscape. But the other thing we notice is the lack of forested vegetation. And this is in due large part to the way that these sites are reclaimed. Um, this picture is perfectly legal, um, but from an ecological perspective, it doesn't provide those services that were there prior to the mining. Um, there's two major issues with these sites that keep them in a state of what we call arrested succession um, or unable to succeed naturally. Uh, one is you know, the loss of the native seed bank, soil mycorrhizae and all those beneficial things all get buried and the topsoil is actually replaced with a substitute, which is usually rock. That rock is compacted so it doesn't erode or move. And those compacted soils don't really support the native vegetation we have in this area. And so the mining companies generally use non-native oftentimes exotic grasses and shrub species for the reclamation of these sites. 
Now, the compaction and those competitive grasses actually won't allow the native vegetation to come in on its own. So these sites persist in a grassland state for decades, if not centuries. In the Appalachian region, we've had about 1.7 million acres that have been um, surface mined for coal and the bond has been released. We have 700,000 acres that are currently permitted for coal mining, so 2.4 million acres of potential land impact. And almost all of this area was forested prior to the mining, and very little of it was getting reclaimed back as forest. So 2.4 million acres is larger than the state of Delaware, it's larger than the state of Rhode Island, and it's nearly as big as the two combined. So it's a significant issue. Um, not only for the loss of force and opportunities associated with that, but also because of the increased force fragmentation in that area. So we did a lot of research over the last few decades to try to figure out how to get trees to grow on these sites. Um, there's lots of physical and chemical limitations. We're dealing with low fertility and almost no organic matter in these you know, mine spoils. Um, we've got water issues, we've got habitat issues, don't have time to go into a lot of that, but we did figure out how to get trees to grow. And one of the early test sites was called the Starfire Mine. Um, this was a site that was planted in 1996. Um, they had two and a half acre cells and each cell contained um, eight native tree species. Um, and what they did was simply look at ways to reduce the compaction. So they asked the mining company to basically build these cells the way that they think that they should reclaim them on the left, the conventional reclamation, and plant the trees as they felt like they were supposed to do as the law required. And then the picture on the right, um, we asked them to essentially take the last six to eight feet of material and instead of compacting it to where it's smooth and, and flat, is just leave it rough and, and take a bulldozer and just one pass over the top of it. So essentially we're creating a raised bed like you would have in a garden. And so that conventional reclamation after 20 years, we see that it has about 20% survival. Whereas that low compaction reclamation, we had 75% survival. Now these trees were grown essentially in rock, <laughs> um, but because they were compacted, um, they were able to put down roots and grow and the rock did have a suitable amount of nutrients in there that weathered and broke down and released to the plants and allowed for their success. Today, those trees are, you know, 50 feet tall. We have closed canopy. Um, you know, and survival is one thing. Those 20% that were in the conventional reclamation were growing well below what we would see a regenerating forest at the same age. And the growth was statistically similar in the low compaction reclamation to a regenerating forest that had been harvested. So 2014, um, these would have been 18 year old trees, 2016 and 2019. Um, so this is just one of, of many sites that we've demonstrated that you can in fact actually get the forest reestablished on a mine land. Guy Cove is another site. This was a whole watershed that was um, basically mined. And um, we went in in about 2008, planted 30,000 trees. And we see by 2019 that the entire watershed is now reforested and on trajectory to become a forest again. So this idea of a regenerative economy, it's with the coal, um, um, industry in decline, um, there was a lot of people in this area who were looking for job opportunities. Um, we have a, a huge land base where potentially we could repurpose um, people who worked on coal mine and drove uh, heavy equipment to come out and rip up these lands and um, participate in ecological restorations. So we have a, a big land base to do this. Um, so we put together a program called Green Forest Work, which is a reforestation program to stimulate the economy and improve the local environment at the same time. Um, the idea was to plant millions of trees on thousands of acres of barren mine land. Um, 
create much needed green jobs in the Appalachian region, which is a economically depressed region of the United States and empower citizens to restore their landscapes and do something about where they live to make the environmental conditions better. So we started Green Forest Work in 2009 with no money. <laughs> um, a coal company loaned us a bulldozer. We got a nursery to give us some trees and we went out and got volunteers to plant them. And each year that organization has grown. We're now up to like 1500 partners. 20,000 volunteers, and we planted a little over 3 million trees thus far through this initiative. Um, we're right in the middle of our planting season right now, and in 2021, we're going to plant 1 million trees. So what started off as a small volunteer effort, we now have lots of funding coming in from grants and philanthropists, and, um, and we're creating jobs in the region. And so, over 5,000 acres in eight states plus. And really the big you know, thing that we have to do is hire equipment operators and we try to find local people to come out and decompact these lands using rippers and excavators and things of that nature. So how are we building local economies? Well, we're contracting equipment operators. Um, we're paying people to collect native seeds so that we can grow in nurseries and greenhouses. We're buying back those plants and putting them in the ground. We're doing monitoring and maintenance on these sites. For the long term, we have future timber, non-timber products. There are also lots of opportunities for carbon uh, credits and things of that nature on these sites, as well as ecotourism. And um, it's been a very successful program, and we're happy to see that it's growing. In 2009, about the time we were starting this, I actually announced that we were going to create Green Forest Work at a meeting at the UN. And I said that although the forestry reclamation approach is the approach that we use to reforest these sites, it's a regional reforestation model. It can be utilized on any lands affected by surface mining and thus has global application. Um, and I think that's correct, that the fundamentals of soil science, plant science, hydrology, and ecology should transfer, even though the tree species and the weather and things like that are going to differ, um, the, those fundamentals are going to be able to guide this. So in 2012, I actually tried to make good on my word here and contacted Nardia, and we set up a project in the Hunter Valley, and I'll turn it over to her now. Thank you. So I guess um, that was just an introductory to understand what we're trying to do here in Australia. The next tape, I guess, is the, um, the Australian side. And I guess the, the conversation needs to start somewhere. Um, and there's other industries that can also come out of the transition process. So forestry, yes, the honey industry, um, the, the pay difference, well, that's that's something that, you know, we all need to work on. And, and I guess the conversation needs to start somewhere. And um, there is a social uh, responsibility for the mining companies um, to be putting back. So the sustainability outcomes are quite huge. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's just, it's a, it's a learning process. I mean, um, yeah, when an industry shuts down, other industries have to take off. And so I guess it's about demand and supply. Maybe just roll my tape for the Australian side. Thanks. Okay. Um, Nadia is just going to, um, has, has got another video for us to watch. So we'll just um, watch that and then see if we have any questions after. Thanks for the introduction, Chris. Hi, I'm Nadia Grant. I have a PhD in mine restoration and I reside on the East Coast of Australia. My presentation will discuss the application of green forest works in Australia and what we are hoping to achieve and currently achieving this year. During uh, my employment at Peabody Energy in 2013, I assisted Chris in a tree planting exercise based at Wombo Mine. And this particular mine site backs onto Woolamai National Park. So here's the uh, natural state of the surrounding landscape. A 
applying Chris's research to the project was an integral part to the tree survival rates, along with the selection of suitable tree species to the area. Here's a list of uh, what, what were the chosen species and uh, the spoil being actually dumped uh, side by side as part of the um, compaction study. Two years on, one by mine in 2015, the trees are looking healthy in their environment. And then in 2019, you can see the, the trees are doing quite well with the accumulation of leaf, leaf litter starting to occur. Recently, Komatsu partnered with Green Forest Works, assisting with site preparation for works in America and offering volunteers for numerous projects. The application was transferred to an Australian site at Anglo-American's Dorsal Mine, where a two-year program began in March 2020. Um, the group planted approximately 4,000 trees with assistance of school children from two local schools, including Anglo-American and Komatsu staff. Here's a, just a snapshot of the collective group on the day. And along with this, we also tried some new uh, technology with planting trees. The cocoons um, hold approximately 25 litres of water. Um, and despite being a very hot day in early March last year, we actually reached our target to plant the trees in a four hour event. Australia's projects in 2021. This year we'll be carrying out the Growing Together campaign with Anglo and Komatsu, bringing in other partners um, with an educational and training element for both Indigenous employment and education for the children about the environmental role we all play. Glencore has expressed an interest in this project and we are planning for an Adember tree planting event with similar outcomes with Anglo American. The Fitzroy Basin Association have progressed with a five-year program targeting landholders for carbon credits and also tackling sediment control outcomes to help with the Great Barrier Reef. <clears throat> uh, talks are also underway with various carbon companies to see how building partnership can create job opportunities, build ecosystem, as well as tackling carbon credits for companies looking to be carbon neutral. Australia's partnership opportunities, uh, we hope to grow an uh, Indigenous tree planting network um, and focus on mine sites returning pastoral land as part of their completion criteria across Australia. We also would like to build on the Great Barrier Reef work with the Fitzroy Basin Association to reduce sediment loads. Uh, continue to work with various landholders on the carbon credit opportunities and partnering with other businesses to build on the Australian Partnership Network. As part of the Decade in Restoration and the Trillion Trees campaign, Green Forest Works has made a pledge to plant 5 million trees in support to the World Economic Forum and Australian Forest US chapter. Wangari Mathi was a Kenyan social, environmental and political activist and the first African woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize. I'd just like to conclude this presentation with a, <laughs> with a quote. The act of planting a tree reconnects the human spirit to the beauty and the importance of the natural world, the basis for all life on earth. Here are just a few of the partners Green Forest Works have worked with over the years, and we are looking to partner with more to replicate this further into Australia. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Nadia. Hopefully you're still on the call for any questions. Oh, we see you. Um, does anybody have any questions before we go to lunch? Shouldn't have said lunch. Okay, I think that you're um, off the hook, Nadia. But thank you so Great. much for coming along and making time. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, before you guys go.